This BYU devotional address by President Cecil O. Samuelson and Sister Sharon Samuelson was given on January 6, 2009. Sister Samuelson is originally from Salt Lake City, Utah. Following her graduation in history education from the University of Utah, she taught school to help support her husband through his early years of medical school. For most of their married life, she has been a full-time homemaker and mother to their five children. She has been active in the community and has served in different capacities in all of the auxiliary organizations of the Church. She and President Samuelson have 11 grandchildren. Sister Samuelson is also a sports enthusiast. President Samuelson completed medical school at the University of Utah and Duke University. He served at the University of Utah as a professor of medicine, dean of the School of Medicine, and vice president of health sciences. Immediately prior to his call to the Quorum of the Seventy, he was senior vice president with Intermountain Health Care. Elder Samuelson was called to serve as a member of the Quorum of the Seventy in 1994. He has served as president of two areas of the Church and just prior to his assignment as 12th president of Brigham Young University in 2003, he was serving as one of the presidents of the 70. We look forward to hearing from the Samuelsons this morning and appreciate the positive influence they've had on BYU for the past almost six years. They are inspired leaders who are totally loyal to those whom we sustain as prophets, seers, and revelators. President and Sister Samuelson love the young adults of the Church, and they love BYU. We are blessed to have them leading this great university. And now we'll have the opportunity of hearing from President and Sister Samuelson. It is indeed my pleasure to welcome you, my dear friends, back to a new semester at Brigham Young University in a new year, 2009. I tend to view a new year as somewhat of a fresh start in my life. It offers me the opportunity to reflect on the previous year and evaluate my life and the growth I hopefully have made as I strive to become the person I want to be in relation to the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I would surmise that most of you have done the same as you attempt to set New Year's goals. As I went through this process and reflected upon the birth of Christ this past Christmas season, I felt so deeply that the world today has an even greater need to make room in our hearts for Him. This past year we have seen that conditions of the world economically, politically, and socially can be extremely dark and depressing without the hope and knowledge of the Savior's mission and message. A short time ago, a friend related to a group of women an experience she had in 1980. She was attending a church meeting in eastern Washington and, while in a Sunday school class, was informed that there were unusual cloud formations in the sky. The class went outside to view them and saw that the formations were indeed very strange and unique. For as far as they could see, the entire sky consisted of huge, puffy gray clouds. They were told that possibly a volcano had erupted on the coast. Upon listening to a car radio, it was confirmed that Mount St. Helens had erupted, and even though the volcano was hundreds of miles away from them, the wind apparently was blowing the clouds of ash toward the east. But at that point, no one was too concerned. However, later in the afternoon, the sky began to get darker and darker. Before long, it was completely black with an eerie darkness that she had never seen before or since. The members were counseled to be careful as they drove home. As she continued telling her experience to our group, she said, There was a sense of concern and fear of the unknown. When we went to the cars, there was powdery stuff everywhere. It was falling all around us. It was coming down like dry rain and contributed to the darkness. There were clouds of ash now surrounding us. It was so dark we could barely see a person standing three feet away. We held our hands and ran to our cars. As we drove, we could barely see what was in front of us. Even with the headlights on, our vision was minimal. The windshield wipers were working hard to push away the constant falling ash. As we slowly drove into the blackness, one thing stood out to me. 
Birds were flying directly into the beam of the headlights. It was obvious that they were seeking light in this time of turmoil and confusion. After we got to our grandmother's house, the th same thing happened. This time the birds were flying towards the windows of the home, often hitting the glass. It was apparent that they were disoriented in fear, and the only thing they wanted was light. They were searching for some kind of hope in the distant lights ahead. It was obvious to my friend as she related this experience that when surrounded by darkness, confusion, fear, and panic, the birds sought only the hope of safety they had at that time, and it was light. You young men and women are on a wonderful journey during this stage of your lives as you move ahead in gaining an education. There will be pathways to follow you may not imagine and experiences which will teach you many lessons of life. Just as the birds experience darkness, confusion, and fear at one point in their lives, so will you. There are wonderful joys and blessings in your futures, but also challenges, fears, sorrows, and disappointments as well. I am certain that even now you could relate numerous examples in your lives that illustrate all of these different circumstances. You have faced challenges and had disappointments, as well as successes and wonderful achievements. You have been excited and joyful, and you have felt inadequate and fearful. However, you are so blessed that whenever you find yourselves amidst difficult and dark times in this troubled world, you have a safe and sure guiding light to bring you peace, joy, and happiness. It is available to anyone who would seek it in every nation, kindred, and tongue. The scriptures teach us that when the times of the Gentiles has come in, a light shall break forth among them that sit in darkness, and it shall be the fullness of the gospel. The restored gospel of Jesus Christ is the sure light that shines for those who seek him, even when we see the workings and mighty influence of the adversary in today's world. Satan seeks to bring darkness into the lives of the children of our Father in heaven, and thus into yours. The previous scripture continues and states, But they receive it not, for they perceive not the light, and they turn their hearts from me because of the precepts of men. Many are like those in Lehi's dream, as described in the Book of Mormon, who could not hold fast to the iron rod or the word of God and, they, and go toward the tree of life. They succumb to the temptations of Satan and the pride, wisdom, and vanity of the world. This is much too common in the world in which you live today. In Mosiah 16, 9, we are taught that our Savior Jesus Christ is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened. Jesus and his gospel are the lights which can guide you throughout your journey here on earth. These lights are brighter and stronger than any darkness you will encounter in this life. The prophet Joseph Smith taught this wonderful principle as he related Christ's message to us in the Doctrine and Covenants. And if your eye be single to my glory, your whole body shall be filled with light, and there shall be no darkness in you. However, Christ's light and the gospel message of light can be darkened in your own lives when you choose to disobey the commandments or when your faith grows dim. Each of you makes choices every day. Some choices can keep you walking in the light, or they can cause you to begin walking toward darkness. You make choices about those with whom you associate. Do they help instill the light of the gospel in your lives? Do they walk the path towards the light with you, or do they nudge you in another direction? The gospel teaches us that that which is of God is light, and that he receiveth light and continueth in light, receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter. Conversely, we are warned, and that which doth not edify is not of God and is in darkness. In September 1989, Joshua Dennis was a young 10-year-old scout who found himself alone, trapped, and lost on a ledge in an abandoned mine in Tooele County, Utah. He spent five days in pitch black darkness as searchers frantically tried to find him. 
To this day, I can recall reading the accounts of this and following them on television. I remember thinking how frightened I would be if I were the one lost, or if it were a loved one in such a circumstance. I could not imagine being in total darkness, alone, not daring to move in any direction, at any age, and for five days. Imagine what he must have felt when he first heard the searchers and saw the light from a flashlight, a light that let him know that he had been found and would soon be with his family. When young Josh spoke at a fireside sometime after his recovery, he said, I wasn't alone in the mine. Heavenly Father sent angels to be with me. I didn't see them, but I knew they were there because I was comforted. I am sure Josh had been taught that Jesus Christ is a light in our lives, and his light can be with us whatever darkness surrounds us. He surely knew that he had the light of Christ with him. This light sustained him and thus helped him find the courage to be brave during his ordeal. It gave him the hope that he would be fine, found. Each one of you has the light of Jesus Christ within you. How wonderful that is for you as you strive to discern what is truly of great worth in your lives. The world of today will offer you many counterfeits to tempt you to turn away from the light of the gospel. Riches, power, and status are all worldly aspirations which have been built up to be great of great importance in the eyes of men. But these can take you down the path toward darkness if you let them. Live so that you are worthy to have the Holy Ghost as a constant companion to help guide you in your choices and in the paths you take, which will lead you in righteousness and eternal joy. During President Gordon B. Hinckley's service as our prophet, we heard often that the Church had come out of obscurity. We have become very visible, and our work, which is the work of our Savior, is being viewed by the world, and it cannot and will not be hidden. This brings many challenges as well as opportunities for all of us. The adversary knows this and will attempt to dim the light of the gospel so that it cannot shine brightly in the world or in our lives. We must be a light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. Christ himself commanded, What manner of men ought she to be? Verily I say unto you, even as I am. You wonderful young men and women are the leaders of the future. You will be leaders in your communities, in the Church, and most importantly, in your families. You will not and cannot be hidden from the world. Others will view you not only as representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but also of the Savior and the message He taught. The Lord loves you and will bless you each day. He has given you the light of the gospel and has asked that you let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. That each one of you here will continually let the light of the gospel shine in your faces wherever you go and in whatever you do is my prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As we begin a new year and a new semester, let me add my welcome to all who are here with us on campuses, as well as all who participate with us in various ways around the world. This is a wonderful season of new beginnings and reflections. 2008 was tumultuous in many ways. It was a time of some significant triumphs and also a time of unprecedented trials for many, both individually and collectively. Much that was unsettled around us continues to be unclear as we enter the new year of 2009. In spite of ample causes for concern and caution, there is much about which we should be encouraged, grateful, and optimistic. In addition to those things we share with all who reside in this land of promise and those in other free lands, we who know who we are and understand what we have should feel great comfort and confidence in our future. We know that challenges, threats, disappointments, and even temporary defeats are part of the great plan that ultimately can lead us to live after the manner of happiness, as described by Nephi in times even more difficult and perilous than our own. But as Helaman lamented, these are our days, with their own special challenges and opportunities. One of the disappointments of our times is the seemingly loss and lack of trust. We have seen this in the failure of government, business, commerce, 
and the personal lives of those both far and near. Like many symptoms of failure, this lessening of trust at multiple levels seems infectious and may be spreading. Today, I would like to suggest why this should not and must not be so. Trust in its various dimensions is essential for each of us and the world around us as well. I speak not in favor of blind trust, but for the essentiality of informed and earned trust, which is integral to all that is good, necessary, and uplifting. President David O. McKay, the ninth president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, was the prophet of my youth and young adult years. He was loved and respected. He spoke with great eloquence and style, and I was always very impressed and touched by his teachings. On many occasions over the years, he said, to be trusted is a greater compliment than to be loved. As a youth, I don't know that I ever doubted the idea that being trusted is more of a compliment or a greater importance than being loved, but I'm sure that I didn't fully understand the significance of this relationship between love and trust that I'm still striving to learn more about and better comprehend. We all long to be loved, and when we feel love from another person or from the Lord, we feel lifted, encouraged, and happy. I think we also yearn to be trusted, but perhaps do not always focus clearly on how it is that we come to be trusted and by whom we are trusted. I believe all of us understand the fundamental notion of trust. We need to trust the Lord and others. Others need to trust us. And we need to especially trust ourselves. Like most of you, I know of instances where important trust has been breached in relationships and agreements. In our recent political campaigns, the issue of trust was raised frequently from every side about who was most trustworthy. It is not a topic that has been foreign to this campus and certainly one worthy of and necessary for our consideration even today. Failures of trust occur when we do not keep even small commitments as well as large ones. Dishonesty of any sort is a breach of trust and has potentially dire consequences not only for the offended but particularly for the perpetrator. Sixteen years ago, President Gordon B. Hinckley gave what I view as a tremendous devotional address here at BYU entitled Trust and Accountability. It is not my purpose to repeat all that he said on that occasion but as Germain do reference some of the concerns and comments he shared that day. He talked in great detail about the trust imposed on each one privileged to be at this university. He included students, faculty, staff, and administrators in his observations and admonitions. He was largely complimentary of the entire BYU community in 1992. And I believe if there is any difference in those here today compared with those he addressed, things and people are even better now. Just as President Hinckley observed in 1992, I would suppose there are also a few exceptions to that general rule today, but they would be few. Unfortunately, some of these very few in our midst have breached their trust in egregious and serious ways, and their disappointments have often splashed on the rest of the community. While love and trust are often linked and even intertwined, there are some very significant differences. We hold unconditional love to be a very high virtue. Trust, on the other hand, is conditional in that it must be earned and can be very easily and quickly forfeited. Long before he became president of the Church, President McKay made this observation. Love is the sweetest thing in the world, but to be trusted throws upon him who receives that trust an obligation that he must not fail to discharge." Close quote. We are often loved even when we are almost unlovable. Think, for example, of an impatient two-year-old's tantrum in the middle of the night or in the middle of sacrament meeting. Frustration does not usually diminish love. This unconditional love persists even when young adults, missionaries, and even BYU students do foolish things, although they know better when making unwise and sometimes dangerous decisions. Trust, however, cannot and is not able to operate with a similar lack of reciprocity. Rather, trust, like knowledge, understanding, and self-discipline, is usually gained line upon line, precept upon precept, in a gradually increasing way until the aggregate of experience causes one to conclude that the individual is trustworthy. Sadly, often a single careless or willful act can destroy the trust that has taken a lifetime to earn. While broken or lost trust can be regained, it is not easily or quickly restored. The blemish can be removed only with serious long-term effort, and even then a permanent scar may remain. 
A special dimension of both trust and love is found in genuine friendship. A true friendship, one of life's most precious possessions, expresses unqualified love but also demands absolute trust. Few, few true friendships are ended by a lessening of affection, but far too many are seriously damaged when trust is breached. Think of this example of true friendship which was enveloped in both love and trust. Willard Richards felt this way about the prophet Joseph Smith. Elder Richards of the Quorum of the Twelve was jailed with Joseph and Hiram Smith and Elder John Taylor in the Carthage jail. Because of the threats on the life of Joseph, the jailer suggested moving the men into a cell where he thought they might be more safe. Joseph asked Elder Richards if he would go with him into the cell. Listen to Willard Richards' reply. Brother Joseph, you did not ask me to cross the river with you. You did not ask me to come to Carthage. You did not ask me to come to jail with you. And do you think I would forsake you now? But I will tell you what I will do. If you are condemned to be hung for treason, I will be hung in your stead, and you shall go free. Joseph said, You cannot. Elder Richards replied, I will. What a blessing to have such a friendship based on love and absolute trust. Your lives before you came to BYU have been documented sufficiently through the admissions process for students or our hiring practices for faculty, staff, and administration for you to be deemed trustworthy. Listen to these words of President Hinckley in his devotional address that I have previously referenced. Every one of us who is here has accepted a sacred and compelling trust. With that trust, there must be accountability. That trust involves standards of behavior as well as standards of academic excellence. For each of us, it carries with it a larger interest than our own interest. It carries with it the interest of the university and the interest of the Church, which must be the interest of each and all of us. Some few students resent the fact that the Board has imposed a code of honor and a code of dress and behavior to which all students are expected to subscribe. Priesthood leaders are requested to interview each student and certify his or her acceptance of the standards set forth in these codes. President Hinckley continues, And so, my friends, we ask you to subscribe to these codes and to have the endorsement of your priesthood leaders in doing so. It is not that we don't trust you but we feel that you need reminding of the elements of your contract with those responsible for this institution and that you may be stronger in observing that trust because of the commitment you have made. With every trust, there must be accountability, and this is a reminder of that accountability." Close quote. Lest any of us who are not students but are still part of the BYU community think we are exempt from this Council and Standard, President Hinckley then went on to clarify. It is also so with the faculty and with all of us. We ask that all members of the faculty, administration, and staff who are members of the Church be what we speak of as temple recommend worthy. This does not evidence any lack of trust. It simply represents a standard, a benchmark of belief and action. The setting of this standard is not new or unusual. It is not new at BYU or in the Church educational system. It is a standard widely applied in the Church. Now, it's not my purpose today to describe all the ways we may violate the trust vested in us at BYU. In fact, I don't believe it would be possible to do so. In that context, I think of the words of King Benjamin as he concluded his great benedictory sermon with his testimony of the Atonement and his counsel about appropriate and righteous living. Said he, And finally, I cannot tell you all the things whereby you may commit sin or violate your trust, for there are diverse ways and means even so many that I cannot number them. But this much I can tell you, that if you do not watch yourselves in your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of God and continue in the faith concerning the coming of our Lord, even unto the ends of your lives, ye must perish. And now, O man, remember and perish not. I hope that you will conclude, as I have, that the matter of trust is a serious issue that deserves our careful and prayerful thought and attention. Let me offer in my concluding minutes four suggestions or homework recommendations, if you will, that will help us all achieve the necessary dimensions of trust in our own lives. First, learn to trust the Lord. In Proverbs we read, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. 
A computer search of the scriptures leads to over 300 references to the instruction to trust in the Lord. The first principle of the gospel is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We may not know everything about God, but we do know, as did Nephi, that He loves His children and He is completely trustworthy and keeps His promises. Second, learn to trust yourself. Our doctrine teaches that as literal spirit children of a loving, absolutely trustworthy Heavenly Father, we are trusted by Him. One of the fundamental reasons for our mortal or earth life experience is to learn to prove or trust ourselves. The Lord who knows us better than we know ourselves has given us commandments so that you may prove yourselves that ye are faithful in all things, that I, the Lord, may bless you and crown you with honor, immortality, and eternal life. We honor our understanding of our relationship with our Father in Heaven when we show that His trust in us is warranted because we have learned to trust ourselves. A necessary component of being able to trust ourselves is repentance, sincere, regular, and authentic repentance. As we are taught by the Lord, by this ye may know if a man or woman repenteth of his sins. Behold, he will confess them and forsake them. We must forsake our sins if we expect to be trusted by others, but especially by ourselves. Third, learn to trust others. President David O. McKay often included in his discourses the principle of learning to trust others. Over 90 years ago in a general conference of the Church, he said this, Tell a young boy that you trust him and you have one of the greatest means of guiding him uprightly that can come into your hands. Young boy, I trust you. To be trusted is a greater compliment than to be loved. Boys are few indeed who will not hold inviolate and implicit trust. President McKay's counsel is true of all of us, boys, girls, men, and women. All of us have had experience with those who have violated a trust or our trust, but the principle of expected trust is generally accurate. Most of us adjust our views of others and ourselves with the input, whether positive or negative, of those we love and respect. Listen to these words of Alma given to the faithful saints in Gideon representing his trust in them. I trust according to the Spirit of God which is in me that I shall also have joy over you. I trust that ye are not in a state of so much unbelief as were your brethren. Or these words of Alma to his son Shiblon. And now, my son, I trust that I shall have great joy in you because of your steadiness and your faithfulness unto God. For as you have commenced in your youth to look to the Lord your God, even so I hope you will continue in keeping His commandments. For blessed is he that endureth to the end. Trusting others is an expression of faith in them. When trusting is exercised wisely, like exercising faith, trust is increased, and increased trustworthiness on the part of well-intentioned others can be the result. Lastly, learn to trust the power of the Atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, which makes the first three relationships of trust truly possible. Because the Atonement of Christ is real, continually operative, and limitless in its scope and possibilities, we can trust it unconditionally with the assurance that all things we cannot accomplish entirely on our own are possible when they fit with the mind and will of the Lord. Just as Abinadi described the Savior's terrible trek through the crucifixion and atonement process as a demonstration of the will of the Son being swallowed up in the will of the Father, the atonement provides us with the means of developing sufficient faith, trust, and obedience that our own wills might also follow the pattern of being swallowed up in the wills of the Father and the Son. Becoming one with God and the Savior must be a primary goal for each of us and the reason for the expectations and promises explained to each of us long before we accepted the assignment to come to earth and be tested and trusted. May we all strive to trust those things of greatest truth and importance to us, and may we also strive to be fully trustworthy in every dimension of our own lives and particularly with the special trusts conveyed to us in our blessed circumstances at BYU. God does live, and He trusts us. Jesus Christ, His Son, likewise loves and trusts us so much that He gave His mortal life for us. President Thomas S. Monson and those who serve with Him love and trust us as well. May we never ignore or betray the sacred trust bestowed upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. For more information on this Brigham Young University devotional, visit byub.org.
This BYU devotional address by President Cecil O. Samuelson and Sister Sharon Samuelson was given on January 6, 2009.